Welcome to Tip Top, growing up your business with Metronomics. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs and CEOs and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their business to their Tip Top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems and stories on how you can grow up your company at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the Tip Top and you feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Jed Roberts. Today I'm with Ian Judson, a fellow Metronomics coach. I've known Ian for quite a few years now, originally as a scaling up coach, and now we work together as Metronomics coaches. Ian, great to have you on the show. How are you? Yeah, great, Jed. Uh, Really looking forward to our chat today. Yeah, well, today we're talking about execution. So one of the seven systems in Metronomics. Uh, Execution for me is one of the things that I focus on right at the beginning of when I start working with a new client. And it's really fundamental to getting getting businesses starting to progress their growth journey. So, Ian, you're a bit of an expert around execution as well as many other things. And and today I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, your background, uh, and then go into some depth around the book that you wrote and your particular perspective on execution. Because we, fa- we all tackle execution a little bit differently. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing your perspective today. Yeah, cheers, Jed. Look, um, let's unpack, uh, I guess, a part of that journey. So I'm a reformed accountant. Well, I started off my career as a chartered accountant, uh, heavily involved in the finance world, talking to small and mid-sized businesses, predominantly in an advisory capacity around tax and their accounting and those sorts of things. Uh, but that led me then to a journey of trying to work out where the value sits in the business. I was involved in a fair few corporate finance transactions where the businesses were being sold or merged with others. And it really piqued my curiosity as to where the value lies in a business. It got me on a journey of trying to look at resources that helped me describe or get a better understanding as to what makes a business tick. I had the good fortune, uh, one of my partners was a fan of Vern Harnish at the time, and he handed me a copy of Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. And he said these prophetic words to me at the time. He said, this book will change your life. And I didn't realize at the time what he was actually probably prompting uh, when he handed me that book and, and, and made those words, but it has in significantly made a difference, I guess, to the pathway that I chose. And so I continued on with my chartered accounting journey. And then I guess because of some of the concepts embedded in the book itself, I then st- set up my own business. And that led me down a journey of using some of the tools that we now use in our coaching world for myself in my own business. Led me to a transaction recently where I sold out of my business. Uh, and now I essentially am a full-time business coach using these methodologies that, that we've learned through the period. So it's been a great journey, I guess, of getting involved in the tools and some of the uh, intellectual property that's attached to this. Part of that journey, I had the opportunity to write a book, one, uh, uh, what we call a monograph, uh, a part of the Gravitas Impact uh, coaches series where a number of coaches are writing smaller books, uh, essentially digestible on a two-hour plane ride of certain sort of topics or issues associated with the building of a business. And I had the good fortune of choosing a topic that I really enjoy, which is execution. And, and great that we can talk about that more also in the context of our podcast today. So I really wanted to get behind a little bit more about what can coaches and business owners do to really get the best out of the execution system. I think you and I know, Jed, that essentially the, the brand promise or the, the thing we really want to provide to our clients in that year one is a kick-ass execution and cash sort of system that's aligned with strategy. And, and, and so I really see it as my goal is how can we really switch the dials up on execution as much as we can. So that led me to write a few things in the book about some of the secret source, maybe around how you can get the best out of teams in that environment, particularly with that execution lens. So it's really the, the ground components, the foundations of those systems that we really concentrate on when you look at executions. So that, I guess, is a bit of the, the, the story behind the book and, and where I am now. Yes, yeah, so execution is one of the seven systems in metronomics. And, and uh, you know, Ian, you, you've mentioned already that this is one of your, your favorite areas and, and, and mine too. And it's normally the one that 
clients really experience first once they start sort of you know, pushing ahead with their growth journey. But what 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 is execution? Now, what, what do we mean when we use the term execution? What, what does it mean to you? Well, I think for me, it's an execution. It's a plan in action. It's essentially distilling the thoughts that you may have. And I, I, I come back to that quote about the man in the arena. I think it's a, a Waldo Emerson sort of quote that basically, you know, you can talk about all this stuff, but until you get in the arena, it, it, it's really, that's where you're going to sort of meet, I guess, the issues and the, and the problems that you're going to face. And execution is a way of giving clarity around what is your plan when those things arise? What is the focus that you always come back to? So for me, execution is a, is a plan in action. It's a, it's a way of getting the ideas and the strategy that you may have built up into momentum and trying to get to a position where your team members are following through on it. It may be influencing the way that you approach your market all those sorts of types of things. So in, in essence, it's where the rubber meets the road. Okay. I, I like that. A plan in action. That's a, that's, a good, that's a good term. I've not heard that before. I like that. I like that. But that also makes it sound that, that it's just around project management. You know, it sounds like, you know, you, go, you, you, you build a plan and you execute against the plan. But execution, in my mind, is a lot more than that. And if we go back to, you know, scaling up, it will you know, it will break it down into three things around metrics, around priorities, around meeting rhythms. You know, so, so what's your take on that sort of structure? Is that how you break execution down also? Yeah, I had a bit of a look on this sort of topic in a bit more detail when I was writing the book, Jed, and I get, get to a point where I was trying to actually compare some of the execution systems across like not only in the metronomics world, but in the other coaching organizations. And also some of the intellectual, you know, uh, institutions like Harvard and, and McKinsey's and, and, and other places like that as to how they approach it. There was often this common theme. I, I found it very difficult to see too many of the methodologies deviate essentially from what we call those three execution disciplines, which essentially what are our priorities? What are our metrics to measure against those priorities? And what are our communication rhythms? to make sure we're communicating those priorities and metrics regularly. And so for me, when I, I couldn't find too many differences in the approaches when I looked at the other coaching groups. And, and I guess it just goes to um, the principle that, yeah, the fundamentals don't change. That it, it, you're trying to find this new way to approach certain things. And, and actually, if there's a true and tried process of what works, then why do we need to deviate? And I think that's what really attracted me to metronomics as a group too, because it's somewhat agnostic to whether you completely follow through on the metronomics execution pieces. But if you've got experience in EOS or scaling up, you can easily sort of embed uh, yourself into the system, even with those execution principles from those other groups uh, coming along with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and for me, execution is all about really converting top line of revenue into profit as efficiently and effectively as possible. And those three structures, the, you know, the metrics, priorities, and meeting rhythms, you know, that, those are really just the, the, the techniques that you use to actually do that, to convert revenue into profit. Exactly. And, and so essentially, it's like, what are we shooting for? How do we measure that? What is a way to knowing whether we're getting there or not? And then what is the actual agendas or what is the process of making sure we're talking about that more often than not? And so they're the core principles as I sort of try to preach in relation to this piece around execution. And for, for listeners that are maybe not familiar with this topic, it might be worth just breaking those three things. You know, what are priorities? What are metrics? What are communication rhythms? Can you just go in th into those in a little bit of detail? Sure. So for me, when we're talking about priorities, it's like, what are the key markers? What are the things that we want to get done? And I guess the first question that a business may ask themselves is, well, what are our priorities? How do we decide them? So when I approached this topic, when I wrote my uh, monograph, I sort of broke the issue of priorities down into two separate sections. There's a formulation process. Like one of the things that we really want to work on, and, and in that context, the way that you may sort of reveal what the priorities of the business will be will be through tools like SWOT. So you get a bit of uh, an insight as to what are the weaknesses and strengths of the team that you have or, or the business that you're in. And then opportunities and threats gives you an exposure to the outside world. So how does the business sit in its context? So that's one tool to essentially get a little bit more of a holistic view 
as to where the business sits and therefore reveal the issues that exist in the business. Another way that we quite often suggest teams can identify their priorities is just through feedback, whether it be through their clients and customers. And, you know, that may be through, you know, the, the devices like an NPS score and those sorts of types of tools, surveys, direct feedback, complaints lines, all those sorts of types of mechanisms to get feedback on how the business is going. And then also internally from an employee point of view, working out, you know, through again, that ENPS, the Employee Net Promoter Score, uh, staff satisfaction surveys, issues that may arise through the weekly, daily meetings that come up to the surface that identify a trend of where there may be an issue or a problem. And again, so that helps the leadership team work out, well, this is what the market's telling us. This is what our employees telling us are probably the key issues that we need to address as we sort of approach the market. We look at our SWOT as another device to sort of you know, validate some of those things. And then from there, we'll formulate what those priorities should be. Then the second stage of priorities is really then the expression of them, using the language to make sure that there's clarity around what is it that we're going. Because quite often, Jed, I've, I've been in workshops and you got a team that suggests, okay, our priority is to improve culture. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean? Exactly. And you're going, well, hang on. How, how does this link to anything? How do we know we're getting there or not? Mm -hmm. And it's so generic, it's just not valuable. And so for me, one of the key things when you're looking at priorities then is a clarity around what is the formulation of what are the key things that we need to be doing and then expressing it in a way where it actually makes sense. We know when we can celebrate it or not. That to me is the key to, uh, behind a good priority. We used to the acronyms of SMART yep. quite often where we're describing those priorities. There's other acronyms too around FAST priorities. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter the methodology. We're probably the biggest uh, fan of the SMART ones, which is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. And so that's the sort of the, the way that we would like to describe a priority, just so it's clear to the team as to what is it that we're trying to achieve. Yep, yep. And, and when, when I first start working on identifying priorities with uh, my clients, you know, one of the things I realize is you know, most leadership teams, they know what they need to be focused on. They know what they need to be working on. But what they haven't really done previously is actually work as a team to align on the three to five things that they're going to focus on over the quarter. Now, yeah, they've all got an idea. Oh, you know, we need to update our CRM. You know, we need to build a you know, employee referral program. Um, but when you mix it all together, one of the things, one of the realizations I see is that, you know, they all realize they've got far too much on their plates and they can't do everything. So on, on, the, on that second day of the, of the kickoff, you know, when we start breaking down into annual priorities and quarterly priorities, you know, they often come to the conclusion of, we've got to start saying no, we've got to start saying no to stuff. And that really goes against the grain for a lot of leadership teams because, you know, we are we're culturally ingrained to try and do more and more and more and more. Uh, and now someone is saying, actually, you need to say no. Someone's giving them permission. The coach is giving them permission to say, which of these things are we going to do and which of the things are we not going to do? And that that for me is often one of the initial points where they start to realize that this is different. And this is going to make a, a, a very big difference to their business because they're now, as a leadership team, having that conversation around what do we do and what do we not do. Exactly. Because we're doing this work in a context of some constraints. And, and, and typically the biggest one is time, but there's also likely to be some budgetary uh, constraints involved in any of these decisions. So it's impossible for any team to probably attack all 24 priorities that may come out of their SWAT session or, or, the, or those sorts of things. Uh, you raise a good point. The, the other thought that came to mind, Jed, when we're talking about how do we decide what priorities we're going to attack, you know, which ones do we say no to, it, it, it very much was a feature, I guess, of uh, Shannon's discussion in Three Hag Way around the analogy of driving the bus around the block. And the priorities that basically may lead to some operational efficiency, but they're a so what sort of priority. And so it's like they may be a nice thing to have and might make a small difference to things, but are they aligned to our three hag? Are they aligned to a future positioning, either from a strategic point of view or a development of a particular capability that really gets us 
further into where we want to head on our strategy. So to me, that's another useful filter to sort of try to help teams decide what are actually our priorities and what things maybe just be an operational efficiency that can be easily copied by our competitors. Yeah, yeah. And it might, might be something you do, but it's a business as usual thing. It's done within the individual function. And it's probably not something that's covered by or addressed by the whole leadership team. Exactly. So there's going to be some things there that you know, mightn't be team-based priority. And that, again, that's another filter I suggest in the book is I tend to like priorities that help the leadership team work together. Because to me, this is linked to that cohesive system that we've got embedded in in the, the methodology and the framework is really trying to make sure that we get the team working together so we can build that team trust to the new level rather than having individuals just go ahead and do their own priorities that, yeah, they might be useful for their own department or their division. Really, it's only helping that particular team move forward. So we, so we work on identifying what teams need to work on. So that's the, the things they're going to focus on over the year or over the quarter. But what about the metric side of things? Yeah, so from the metrics point of view, so the second discipline, I guess, of execution, I just use the thing of endpoint KPIs or, you know, what is the actual goal and then uh, in-process KPIs. Yeah, how do we measure progress as we're going along? And so for me, it's always good to have a bit of a mixture of those. So uh, another terminology or framework is leading and lagging indicators. And so typically a lot of the metrics that we may see uh, teams want to gravitate gravitate towards are the financial ones. And they are most typically lagging indicators because we need to go through a process of calculating you know, revenue or getting the accounts in or those sorts of types of processes to work out where we actually are positioned. What's really important is to try to find those in-process KPIs that help us get us there. And I think that's where the KFFM key function flow map really helps identify some of those leading metrics and indicators to work out what is our progress on a particular activity. Are we going to hit the goals that we set for ourselves in the various sort of functions and businesses uh, to sort of try to get to the end result? So metrics coming in both sort of ways. It can be coming, what is the journey as we're going along and metrics that help us measure those sorts of types of things. And ultimately metrics like revenue, profit, cash, which are the outcomes of those activities and essentially the sum total of all of those decisions that we're making along the way. I use the, the way I describe that with the clients that I work with is that the, the metrics are the things that you're going to measure and they could be financial or they might not be financial. Whereas the targets are the values you set on those metrics at a point in time. So it could be at the end of the year, it could be at the end of three years, it could be at the end of the quarter or the month or the week or the day. So the metric is the thing, the target is the actual number you're allocating to that thing. So they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. So that that's what we typically cover in like some of the good stuff that we can do in this area is like working out what is the dashboard mm -hmm. that the teams use to sort of try to get a pulse or a feeling of how well the business is tracking. And obviously tools like metronome, growth systems, and those sorts of types of packages are useful to help us track uh, some of those elements in the KPI world. So that's essentially the second discipline that you tend to focus in on when it comes to execution. So crack that, you've got goal and metric clarity. Exactly. That, that's yeah. where you're really trying to get to. Yeah. But why is that not enough? Why is that not enough? What else do we need in the execution system? This is, this is three disciplines, isn't it? Now, just because we've set a target, just because we've decided what we're going to work on, that's not enough. We need that meeting rhythm, that cadence that keeps the focus, keeps the discipline going. And it's exactly right, Jed. I, I, I know through the work that we've done together, both in scaling up and, and metronomics, the focus when we're doing our quarterly planning sessions and annual planning sessions is we typically start with a metrics view and try to get a feel of what the targets will be for the quarter ahead or the year ahead. Then we'll put our priorities and express those ones that, you know, one to five, try to put a limit on how many we're doing there. And the team may feel that that's the job done. And it, you're only talking uh, those sorts of topics with the leadership team. And ultimately then we're getting to the end of the day and we go, but guys, you now have to communicate these concepts, these outcomes to your team. So this is where things like the cascading messages 
aspect of it is very, very important to try to get the team to agree what is it they're actually going to communicate to the the, the wider team to make sure that you, they're clear as to what you're trying to achieve. So we get then into the realm of meeting rhythms. And so we have obviously a progression of a number of meetings that have different time periods and different focuses to try to make sure that that communication is constant, but we'll have different elements and focus areas. Happy to go through those meeting rhythms in a little bit more detail, Jed, if, we, if, if now's the appropriate time. Oh, there, there is a fair amount of detail in those, isn't there? That's, that's probably one, that if people want to get into that detail, they should go and buy your book, I reckon. I think so. I think, look, obviously there, there's a fair degree of consistency in, in what they look like, but essentially in a nutshell, we've got a daily sort of tactical get together uh, as the, the main point, And that's a meeting that only goes for something like seven to 15 minutes. If you're going longer than that, it's a bit of a problem. Then that will flow through to a weekly, throw to a monthly, and then to our quarterly annual planning sessions that typically go for a day or two days for the annual as a progression of these are the sort of meetings that we need to have there, the length of period of time that we need to have to discuss those issues. And the elements and the agendas of those meetings are pretty well covered in the books. So I, we, we won't go through that in more detail here. But yeah, to me, it's just getting a clarity around, okay, when we get together, what do we need to be talking about? And this is where I'd probably prescript uh, most teams to stick to the agendas. There may be a desire to influence and put other items in the agenda because they're trying to meet different purposes in relation to the reason why they get together. Um, a lot of teams, I sense, want to have a, a one meeting for everything, and whether that may cover regulatory issues, OH&S, a compulsory sort of uh, item of insurance maybe where they have to have a risk meeting every certain while, and they want to throw it into this meeting stew of, okay, we'll talk about that in, in this meeting. So I, I would suggest strongly that the teams that are undertaking a strong focus on execution just really stick to the agendas as they're prescribed in, in the text and, and make sure that you have the meeting that's very much focused on talking about getting back to our execution disciplines, talking about our priorities, talking about the metrics. They're the key elements of what need to be discussed in those meeting frameworks as, as a general rule. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a nice, succinct wrap-up. More detail in the books. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, to the viewers and listeners who are watching this or listening to this podcast, if you're enjoying this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to smash that bell, and then it will notify you of any further episodes. We release a new episode every two weeks. They're released on a Monday, so morning time, America's time zone, and evening time, Australian time zone. Now, moving on, Ian, I'm not going to try and uh, remember this, but uh, in your book, you, you you had a quote or a, a phrase that um, I just wanted to read out to you, because I think that takes us nicely into, into the next part of the conversation today. Although execution is important, there are two foundational things that need to be in place. Firstly, there needs to be a clear strategic vision, so the things we are doing are the right things. Secondly, the organization needs to be ready for a change. That change readiness is one of the things that often isn't in organizations. How do you tackle that? It's a good question, Jed. I, I wish I had the answer completely nailed every time in relation to how do you actually get people wanting to change? I guess you've got to look at the indicators as to, well, how genuine are people wanting to change their current outcomes. And, and I guess the evidence would be that typically CEOs and their leadership teams may turn to someone like me when they've got a financial outcome that doesn't seem to be changing. And, and quite often that will be a symptom of obviously not just doing the same things and not really changing their approach. And I think the first step when it comes to that is an awareness that if we keep on doing the same things, we're going to get the same outcomes. So we have to undertake a process mm -hmm. of, we, are we willing to change? Do we have a desire to change? And so I think you and I had the good fortune of doing some training with uh, one of the external advisors to the group, Gina Olicon-Long, uh, at some stage during the COVID years when we were yep. 
um, doing some work together on, on in the virtual world around um, the, the, the N, NPL, isn't it? Yeah. Neural Linguistic Programming. NLP, NLP sorry, NLP. Mm. And, and you get to that point where one of the key takeaways for me, and I describe a little bit more in the book, is like, you know, well, well, how do you make change happen? You need to have this desire to change. And so you really need to be working with a team that have made that commitment. They're aware of their situation. They're looking at their results and they have a genuine burning desire to actually change those outcomes or achieve a greater goal. And then looking at, well, the team need to be willing to do what it takes to implement that. And you really need to get a sense of, okay, do we have the team members in place that are willing to go on this journey with us? And that's where it can get a little bit uncomfortable because we really need the team leaders to identify, okay, if we're going to express that this is the direction that we want to take the business, are you with us or against us, or you still want more information, uh, is where a lot of teams end up. And and yeah, tell us the people that are willing to take us on that journey or, or help us on that way. And if we can distill the vision, if we can work out the reasons why we want to do that in a meaningful way, so the team members on, on the ground get a good understanding as to why the organization is doing it. So that's why we need to link things to a purpose. We need to sort of explain to the, the broader group as to, you know, why does the organization exist? Why, why do we want to do the things that we want to do? Uh, and then get back to values and then, you know, things that really sort of explain how things are going to be done around the organization, make sure that there's a good clarity around those values and what's going on there. And then we do that envisage future sort of exercises to go, this is where we want to go. And so that may lead to some people flagging earlier that they don't want to be part of that. They, they may uh, decide that that's not the type of firm or environment that they want to be in. And it may lead to that outcome where you, the team that need to take you to that next stage mightn't be the team that you've got now. And there may be some changes that you need to make, not only, I guess, at that ground level, but also at the leadership team. And that's one of the scary things, I guess, that we need to sort of address with the CEO right from the get-go is the team that you have right now might not be the team that you'll have that gets you to that position in that you suggest that you want to be in the future. And I'd add to that, they're rarely the team that get you to where you want to be in the future. And the, 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 there was a speaker at last year's Tip Top, uh, Paul Glazer, and he, he used the, I'm not going to get the numbers exactly right, but he used the analogy of every time your business doubles, you're going to lose about 40% of your team. And that's not necessarily because they're going to leave. It's because they can't grow themselves fast enough to keep up with the growth of the business. So if you're in a fast growth business, unless you're incredibly lucky and you've hired incredibly well, the team you've got right now is not going to be there with you in two, three years time. And that's just a reality of business. Now, some people will select out. Some people will basically acknowledge that someone needs to come in above them. And maybe that gives them an opportunity to learn their craft for another year or so and then step into the into the elevated role. Exactly. And I think it reinforces, Jed, the, the work that we know is like, what are the three most common barriers to growth? And the first one is going to be the capability of the leadership team. And unless we got the right team in place to be able to take us to that next place, uh, then to your point, it may be like a 40% attrition is needing to occur in order to get the right people in the right seats, doing the right things using Jim Collins language. So, you know, in the second and third elements is a lack of market expertise. So it may need, we may have a need to get someone with that requisite market expertise or, or build the capability of the firm to take that on board. As well, and then the ability to scale the infrastructure of the business to get to that next point. So I guess they're the sort of the, the characteristics that we may be using as a filter when we're looking at the team. Are they ready for change? Is making the assessment as to, okay, well, how good are our leadership team? What, what's the capabilities of them? And we may use some tools to identify their strengths and weaknesses in relation to those sort of things and how they may work together. Through things like disk profiling, other tools, you know, the big five personality traits sort of type of exercises that help identify uh, the strengths. Um, Pat Lencioni's six types of working genius, those sorts of types of tools were really helpful to work out the capabilities of a leadership team. And then we'll sort of take that further then to sort of work out, okay, well, do we have the market expertise? Do we know where we're heading? 
and then get to that next stage of that scalable infrastructure? Do we have the people that know the type of business that we need to build? And that may be useful to work out. You know, do we have an organization that's willing to change? And even probably, I think the easiest conversation, Jed, would be the one that we have with the CEO. You, you sort of get to that point of what do you actually want to achieve? And if you've got a CEO that's very much focused on, I like the book, Pat Lencioni's The Motive. And it gets to that point of why we're doing this. And if you've got a rewards-based CEO, then we know that you know, they may just want efficiency. They just want to maximize potentially what they've got and not very much focused on the growth element of you know, the options they have in front of them because they're comfortable and it's a nice place to be versus those that are really driven like by purpose, those that want to sort of create a dent in the universe and those sorts of types of concepts. So they're the sort of clues I would sort of use to sort of try to get a feel as to, is this team ready to change? Are they willing to take the leap? That raises a really interesting point around, you know, the, it's the CEO that normally drives this initiative. It's the CEO that realizes that they, they want to do something, they want to achieve something. But often they, they work out that they can't do it by themselves or they need some sort of help. So what are the characteristics or what's the situation that you often see CEOs being in that resulted in them picking up the phone and giving Ian a call? Now, there's, there's probably some similarities there. What do you see? I tend to try to identify those CEOs that are go to a seminar they're looking for answers in a particular topic. So they might go to a top grading seminar or they might go to this and you start a conversation with them and they identify that, yeah, well, why did you come here? And they go, well, I've got a problem with this and this is what I'm, I'm trying to achieve. And you work out though that, you know, they've got an incomplete toolkit. And so they go to these seminars to try to work out, well, how do I fix a problem here or whatever without necessarily sort of trying to adopt a full methodology. So it's a bit like uh, the, the, the analogy that Shannon uses quite a bit of that whack-a-mole sort of type of CEO positioning. Now, they're a desperate CEO looking for a solution and they whack this problem with the outcomes of a seminar and they try to put that in place, but without sort of support from their leadership team or others, that, that the initiative probably dies very quickly soon after. Yeah, initial implementation because there's no further support to make that uh, change real or, or, or embedded permanently. So you, the CEO is typically you know, trying to just fight fires, deal with issues all the time, and, and they're looking for solutions. They're looking for a number of, I guess, books or seminars or podcasts or, or these sorts of type of things to try to get the answers. So you're typically identifying a CEO that's desperate for knowledge, desperate to sort of try to find a solution. And so they're potentially some of the, the markers of working out, well, who's the right sort of type of CEO to, to sort of try to take advantage, I guess, of a full-blown system, one that connects the team to the plan. And so for me, it's to try to identify you know, CEOs that have the ability. They're not just focused on results. They have an appreciation that they have a team in place. To your point, Jed, they realize they can't do it all on their own. And so they realize that part of that dynamic is that they have to bring a team along. They have to have the skill set to be able to sort of bring the soft edges of the systems together, you know, around the human systems, that underlying foundation around the culture, and also making sure that the leadership team that they have in place works cohesively, that, that you know, to get to a level where there's a high level of trust in those team members and appreciation of they know what to do to help the CEO achieve the vision. And getting to that point where all those come together to enable the CEO to move forward. Yep. So they're 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 learners. You now they probably read lots of books, and they're probably self aware because they recognise that they can't do it by themselves. And if you if you're not self aware, then you probably think you can do it all by yourself. And I think you you mentioned yeah they've tried to do some some things and it hasn't really got them to where they want to get to. So they know there's something out there, but they just can't put their finger on it. So that's really, that's, you know, that's very similar to the characteristics I noticed too. Yeah. And it gets to that, again, that the comment I made earlier about what are their motives? You know, what is it actually trying to achieve? That, that helps allude as to where they may sit on that spectrum of learning as well. And Shannon uses the term in her, in her books a lot, you know, willingness and desire. You know, you've got to have both. You can't just have one. You've got to have the willingness and the desire to make the behavior change that you need to make in the business. 
And not everyone's prepared to do that because change is hard and we, we generally resist changes as humans. Exactly. And I think you try to make it sort of clear what is the actual role of the coach in that environment. And, you know, when CEOs come to you, you know, well, well, actually, what is it that you can do? And for us, we're instigators, we're catalysts for change. We're, we're trying to help them and their teams adapt to change. And essentially, so a lot of the work that we're doing on this topic is really trying to get the team ready for change and hold their hand in the process of clarifying what is the methodology that we know, the critical path that we know works to get to those end outcomes that they want to achieve through our experience, through our, our dealings, working with a number of clients in this area to try to help them you know, realize there is a process, there is a pathway. Going there. It, like every organization's pathway is going to be slightly different to, to another's. It's not a cookie cutter approach. It's not like that there's one path that, that, that suits all, but there are some commonalities to it. And we know the indicators of things that we need to work on first before we know we can actually get to the change points and, and the end results that we're looking to achieve. One of the really smart things I think Shannon has done um, in, in how she's built the system is that she's integrated what we call the behavioral platform, uh, the, the, the behavior, behavior change platform that is the metronome software. Now, and most people, when they first realize that there is a software platform, they think, okay, well, this is something that we can just use to track our metrics and how we're going on our priorities. Uh, but over time, people start to realize, well, actually, this is the platform that's actually making the change happen in the organization because it's enforcing accountability. And people who want to be on the journey, who are being held to account and hold others to account, they're going to change their behaviors over time. Uh, and it is the metronome growth software that does a lot of that. But it's, it's almost being done under the covers. No one actually realizes it until they realize it. But until by that point, it's a good thing. At that point, they've realized that this behavior change is what is needed. And it's the platform and it's the accountability and it's all the systems that are bringing that all together. Uh, and now you've given us a great overview of, of execution, but how does execution actually fit into the other systems in metronomics? Because it's just one of the various systems. Exactly. I think the thing that impressed me about the metronomics book, and it wasn't overly stated, but it's there hidden if you, if you think about it in a particular way is the executions are really there to enforce the other systems to a large degree. How? Through the structure of the agendas of the meetings is really the place. I mean, that's the environment, that's the forum where you connect the team to the plan because it, it's, it's the easiest and the most logical place where you're going to be able to express the strategy, the ideas of what's to be achieved through the mechanisms of like you know, metronome growth systems, the dashboards to explain progress and those sorts of things. And it has to be in a meeting environment that that occurs. So with meetings embedded firmly in the execution piece, and we've got some good material there to work out, okay, what are those agendas? What should we be talking about? How long? Those sorts of types of things. You really then get an appreciation of what is it really enforcing? So one of the, the things as, as an example, good news. We always want to start off our meetings with good news. Why? Why would we want to do that? There, there, there's a number of things that we could be talking about. Some people, you know, culturally just want to cut to the chase. They, 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 but, you know, others just want to have a, a chit chat. But why do we do good news? Well, we need to connect with our team. And so that really as a mechanism is helping embed the cultural elements of the system that we have, you know. Are we honing in on those value pieces? Are we, are we honing in? Are we giving recognition to some of those behaviors? And, and one of the really good tips I got out of one of the sessions on, you know, what should you cover in good news? I think I got it out of Michael Bungastania's work, is that you can break it down into people, projects, and patterns. And so in good news, you may talk about people that are doing good work. And it's a nice way to reinforce the values of the business by highlighting people who have done really good work in, you know, it might be a, a, a minor way from a point of view of an overall impact of the business, but still the right sort of things that you want to be alluding to. So that's an example, I guess, of you know, a placeholder to make sure you reinforce that cultural piece. Um, 
looking at projects, you can talk about the elements of what is in our strategy. What are the things that we're really trying to achieve here and talking about that and that good news. So you might have a win on a new client that you want to talk about or a, you know, a project that finished and, and, and those sort of minor celebrations that we can have along the way to, to make sure it doesn't feel like just business as usual every time. And then patterns of behavior that you see changing are a really good element to sort of embed in that good news area. So having the good news at the beginning is a way to connect that execution sort of process that's happening as the sort of the automated system, the what just the automatic thing that we do, but it's actually helping you reinforce things like culture, helping you reinforce things like cohesion and those human systems. So to me, that's one example of how execution is intricate is linked to the other systems in a way where, ah, I, yeah, it is connected. It's not just doing execution for the sake of execution. Like, you know, finance is not just for the, just done for the sake of finance. You don't do that. It has to be linked to your operations. It has to be linked to, to the outcomes you're trying to achieve in the business. So nothing should exist in isolation when you're approaching this work. So to me, execution touches on those other systems quite consistently. Where? In the meetings, typically, is where we really want to be focusing that energy. Yeah, I've I've had a couple of uh, CEOs come to me sort of in you know, a six, nine months in saying, oh, you know, when are we going to start working on the cohesive system? And uh, my answer to all of them is, well, the, about 10, 15 on day one of the, of the kickoff because that was all cohesive system, but we've never introduced it as such. It's just something that we build into the agendas, we build into the meetings, and over time, CEOs realize that they're having conversations that they couldn't have had six months before. And what's changed? Well, all we've done is we've introduced some really subtle techniques and really subtle questions uh, into how we run our workshops. So the impact of those is um, is often not recognized until it is. So, so for me, Jed, another example, I guess, of how we um, help link execution to the other system, I love the 13-week sprint lanes. Because it's essentially like that mini event that you can get teams to embrace because it's it, it's like a sprint. Well, why do we call it sprint lanes? Well, it, it's that 13-week sort of journey where there's a clear start and finish line. It's not in the sort of so distant future that people don't focus in on it. It's really like active now. And it really feels like the team might be undertaking a game, a, a thing that they can sort of focus in on for a shorter period of time to make them uh, connected to it. So. The great thing about a 13-week sprint lane is it's got accountabilities in there. It's got clarity around your priorities. It's got widgets, so it's going to connect to your human system. Uh, who's responsible for what? So it's identifying functions, who's got it. Being able to predict those things is all elements, I guess, of those scorecards that we'll have in the human system. Who's got this? You know, clarification around that the, the, the aspects of the business, the functions. Uh, who's got control of the widgets, all those things come together to help the team come together to get that cohesion sort of happening. So again, another environment where you go, oh, I see 13-week sprint lanes in the execution system. That's it. That's all we've got to do. But it's actually triggering so many other systems when you're going through that discussion to get to that higher level of team trust. So if a team that predict together and get closer to those results that they want uh, it's just flexing those muscles that might be underutilized quite a bit in, in organizations. So our goal as coaches is to try to turn those things on. And while we mightn't scream out that they're connected to this system or that system, behind the scenes, we're making sure that those things are happening. Yeah, and, and that's our role as coaches, to bring that all together and, and often in uh, subtle ways that clients aren't aware of. You know, we're we're not hiding things from them. We're just presenting it in a way that it's easy to consume as a as a leadership team. I think I think one of the the exciting parts of uh, of this system for me, the metronomic system, is when we finally get to the point where we actually bring strategy and execution together in the form of the brand promise and the guarantee. Uh, and I, I currently have two clients that are sort of you know going through that process of agreeing their brand promise and their guarantee. You know, and the the trepidation of actually turning that on because you know that if you get that brand promise and guarantee wrong, it's going to cost the business a lot of money. But that's really where strategy and execution join. You know, if you haven't got execution running 100% okay, and if you're not 100% confident on your strategy, then you probably shouldn't implement your brand promise and guarantee quite yet. And the thought when you talk about that, Jed, 
in my mind is the reason why we have execution run the way it is very much to a script, very much to a process is to try to get faster and quicker at these things, not because it's unimportant, but because we want to have the time to focus our teamwork on strategy and some of those other pieces. Uh, so execution under the system deliberately set up as a, it's very consistent from quarter to quarter, year to year. And that's the goal. It's deliberate. It's so we can enhance our talk time as a leadership team on some of those other topics, but not treat execution as unimportant, but we get so good at executing. And that's really what we want to achieve, I guess, by the end of the foundation phase of implementing metronomics is really having that execution process work quite quickly. And I can notice it in my teams, as you talk about in my clients, you know, yes, yeah, at the like 3 p.m. mark of, of, of a quarterly, but the teams are good at execution can still get everything done in two hours, but just because they're so good and polished at it. And it's great because it's giving you that extra time to be able to thrash through maybe a brand promise issue or those sorts of types of, uh, of concepts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, when you see the leadership teams, when they're coming to do their metrics, they're taking their calculators out, they're having the conversation around, okay, this number of leads, this number of opportunities, and you know, through that, we need to get this number of orders. You know, operations, can you deliver that number? You know, okay, yes, I can, but I need to hire two more factory people. Uh, yeah, HR, can you deliver those over the next? So having those joined up conversations you know, where everyone has got alignment, everyone is clear on what they're going to work on over the quarter and the numbers that are going to tell them whether or not they've won or not. Exactly. And I think yeah, you know, to the question you you raised earlier, I mean, how does the execution fit into the other systems? I think the closest sister or or system, I guess, to execution is that cash, because you want to see the results. So, to the point that we typically pose when we want to get an idea as to how where execution is running in any system, well, have you hit your revenue targets? Have you hit your profit targets? Have you hit your cash targets consecutively in the number of periods? And so there's that financial metric cash system there that is really, I guess, the indicator as to how where our execution is running. And so it's always good to have teams in those execution modules or, or periods to be talking about how it relates to results in the cash system. So then we've got that clarity. And once we get teams connected to you know, their financial results and the widgets that drive those results, then we know we're getting on that pathway connecting the team to the plan. And that's the goal, I guess, of this foundation phase. Absolutely, absolutely. And Ian, I know you are a, a reformed accountant, but I would love to get you back on the podcast and we can spend some time talking about the cash system because I know that's something that you are a, you know, a, keen, a keen supporter of. Yeah, I, lo I love it. it. It's hard not to connect it in the context. And again, coming back to that promise of what should a uh, a, a team undertaking metronomics try to achieve in that first year. And if we can get execution and cash running well, where the team own the forecast rather than everyone turning to the, the head of the finance or CFO to you know, always you know, answer the questions on the metrics and those sorts of types of things, that's any uh, behavior that we want to change in that first year. So it, it's a great topic, obviously quite important at the moment when we go through some of the economic presentations and data that I get access to indicating downturns in particular economies. I mean, it's not a, it's a broad sort of type statement. Economies are down. Not every business is subjected to the same factors as, as each other, but say some businesses might be booming at, right at this point in time. But generally, I guess, you know, with higher interest rates and inflation that we, we're seeing pressure there. So I think cash is a really good thing to be, um, very aware of and, and how do we improve our system and build our capability, our, our, our infrastructure on finance to make sure that when things do turn, that we've got the right processes to make sure that we can meet the market. Because there's no point having a very strong strategy system and leadership team if the finance or cash piece can't keep up. If we don't have the fuel for growth, then none of these objectives and, and, and targets are going to be able to be met. So they're the sort of things that make cash, I think, a very important topic right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we should get that next episode scheduled and uh, we can talk cash. Sounds good, Jed. All mm -hmm. for it. Okay, so before we, before we wrap up, if you were to say what would be the one thing that a leadership team should do to start making progress on building out their execution system, 
what would you say that would be? I think it goes, and this is going to be a longer answer, potentially the one you wanted, but I, I think it goes back to that question of how do we get that indicator for change? How, how do we know that this leadership team is, is willing to change, do what it takes? And, and the simplest task from an execution point of view to test that is the prescription that they have to do a daily huddle as a leadership team for 30 days. That's the test you put them up to. So in order to get this process started, that's the advice I want to see provided to teams. That's the activity I want them to undertake because that will start that indicator of change, that physical meeting, that probably is the best indicator that they're willing to change, willing to do something different. And that structure of that daily huddle, you know, some variations, but typically it starts off with a what's up or a good news, what's up, what's going on, go through your metrics quickly or a critical number that help connect the team to that plan. And then essentially, you know, what do you got on for the next 24 hours? What you stuck? What are the, what are the things that you're looking on? Is there any issues that sort of type of thing? So if you can quickly get around those three sort of cornerstone topics when we're, we're, we're doing this work in the daily huddle, that's the best place for me in my mind to start an execution, revamp or, or, or yeah, fine tune the process a bit more. Absolutely. So daily huddles, skeptic to supporters in 30 days or less. And it's the best way to get the team to notice the change too. And if you can roll out, if you're brave enough to roll out those daily huddles across the whole team, then you, you tend to find that that will show uh, a good indicator by the leadership team that um, you know, the whole organization is embedded as well. And funnily enough, my work, Jed, is that typically a lot of those daily interactions do happen at the lower level anyway. Um, you know, when you get to work, most people are going to interact with their direct teammates and, and, and go through good news. What would they do? What are they up to? Those sorts of types of things. So we just put a little bit more formal structure to that without necessarily the formality breaking down, I guess, the cohesion that we're trying to create. Okay, Ian, thanks so much for that. Always love chatting to you. It's always a really, really interesting conversations and and I always get some real nuggets of, of gold out of out of the chats that we, we have together. So thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Jed. Appreciate the chat. Like you, I love learning from other coaches and other commentators and it's the process of learning more. Yeah, how do you approach a topic like execution that you think is very known and established? And what extra elements can you get out of it? So, really appreciated the time and chat as well. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this 20 plus year old proven system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M E T R O N. O-M-I-C-S dot com. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else the great podcasts are found.